Good morning again. So, don't you love the musicians helping us worship the Lord? And we just thank them. They're just so, so, so amazing. All right, so let's, let's say the word. Restored. Restored. So we've been talking about restoration over the past uh, several weeks. And, and, and the, the Hebrew word is just so much easier. So maybe that's the one you want to stick with. It's aruka. So you can say that and wow your friends tonight at your Super Bowl party. You can say, i got this old car in the back. I'm thinking about Aruka in it. And they'll just say, what? Well, it's Hebrew. You know, we're learning a lot, you know. So, Or you can use the, the, uh, the Greek word, which is apokastasis. So let's go with Aruka, right? Way too many syllables on that other one, right? So we found out in, in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 13 that, that Paul says we should pursue full restoration. It says in some translation we should aim for perfection. That's frightening to a lot of us, right? But to pursue full uh, uh, restoration means that we are willing to place ourselves in the master's hands so he can restore us to what we are supposed to be. But the second meaning behind that is what an artist does Whenever they look at something like this white canvas, you know, a polar bear in a snowstorm, that's as good an art as I'm ever going to give, right? And they look at this and they see something and something amazing comes. Placing ourselves in the hands of our master means that he does something artful and amazing with us. That's part of restoration. So we also learned with Zacchaeus, let's see if you remember the fact there. Zacchaeus was less than how many feet tall? Less than five feet tall, right? In this particular part of Palestine, if you are deemed a man and short, you're under five feet tall. But he learned that whenever you accept the invitation and you bump up against Jesus, you get restored. And restoration, hear this, restoration involves a response. We can't just go, oh, look at what God did something great and become fat baby Christians, right? Right? There's a response, and he started giving stuff away. He started making stuff right himself and restoring relationships himself. And then last week, and I love this text from Joel chapter 2, we found out that that our God will is willing and, and able and desiring of restoring years lost. Did you know if somebody who accepts Christ on their deathbed, God will restore whatever minutes, hours, days they have. He will do something amazing with it. Anybody ever felt like you had some lost years? Anybody here, children of the 60s, will pray later. Uh, and I tell you, it's an amazing thing to find out that the, the years destroyed by the locusts, that, that, that God said he's going to restore them. He's going to ruka them. He's going to allow them to become something special, something amazing, something overwhelmingly good. Today we're going to go to something really, really familiar. But first, let me ask you a question. Who are you? Who, 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 who? Some of you don't get that reference. But anyway, it's from, you know, the who. But anyway, who are you? Who are you really? Who are you really? There was this, this woman, she, had, she was in this car wreck and she had a near-death experience. And, and in the context of this, she actually had this near-death experience. She had passed away clinically and she was standing before the Lord. And, and she said, Lord, I, I, I don't think I'm ready yet. I, I just, I really want to go back. And he said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit more time. You can, you can go back. You know, I want you to do something great with it. I want you to go back. So she goes back. She wakes up in the hospital. And while she's in the hospital and they're, they're doing work on her and everything, she decides she might stay a little longer, you know, because the Lord had promised her a, a good 20, 30 more years. And, and she decided that she was going to get all these years that maybe she'd have, she should have a little work done. So things got nipped, things got tucked, things got stretched, things got, you know what I'm talking about. And, um, uh, and so she's in the hospital. She's going to stay there anyway. So she spends a couple of weeks, kind of gets all healed up. And she's feeling really great about herself. And she steps out of that hospital and wham! Ambulance runs her over. She's standing before the Lord. And she's like, what? What? I can, you said I was going to get 20, 30 more years. 
He said, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> who, who are you? Back in the, in the 60s, there were a lot of people that got in VW buses and they went to Colorado to find themselves. Guess what? Themselves wasn't there. They found some other things, but they didn't find themselves, right? You see, there's something powerful about being restored by God into who we really are. And there's millions of trajectories that just hit your brain when I said that. We'll see if we can clean that up scripturally today. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you for the Psalms, Lord. I want to thank you for this amazing book, this amazing text that we're so familiar with, Lord. But I ask that, that you would make us more and more open to the wideness and the power of what is being said in this text today. Lord, I, I ask for everyone here who is living an exhausted life of pretending to live into an identity that is not them. Lord, I, I pray over those today who feel lost and unidentified because they haven't discovered who they are in you. And Lord, I pray for mighty, powerful, overwhelming Aruka, refreshing restoration to hit their souls today. And Lord, as for me, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase and be our preacher and teacher today. And all the people said, Amen. If you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to go to Psalm 23. It's great to bring your own Bible or your, or your electronic Bible or your iPad or your MePad or ThePad, whatever, and bring that, and, and you, can, you can pop the text up for yourself. Anybody ever heard of Psalm 23? Maybe a couple, three, right? Okay. Maybe other than, than, than John 3.16 is probably the most second recognized text in the Scripture, even if people don't know the Lord, they've heard of it, right? This was written by David, not me. I know it shocks you. It's not me. It's another David. It was a few years back, right? And he was a shepherd who ended up being a king. We all know about David and Goliath and all the different stories. We know about David and Bathsheba, or as my seminary professor called it, Bathsheba. I think that was not how you really said it. He said it for effect. But anyway, so... We have this man who's a man after God's own heart, deeply flawed, but he understood the concepts of how our God positions us and then refreshes our soul. So let me just go through it real quickly, and then I really want to challenge us and encourage us today. Verse 1, Psalm 23, the Lord, everybody say Lord. If in the, in the, in the uh, uh, NIV, it's usually capitalized Lord. Let me tell you why. Because it's yod heh vav heh in the Hebrew, which means it's Yahweh. And that was not the name you mentioned if you're a Hebrew person. You never said the name of God. And so they would say the word Adonai, which is Hebrew for Lord. And so as they went through in the text, and I actually learned this whenever I was, I was uh, going to, to seminary. And you'd go through and you hit yod heh vav heh Yahweh, what we say Yahweh. You skip over, you always say Adonai instead of Yahweh. So, wrapped up in this word is literally, I am who I am. I am who I am. Self-sufficient. Don't need nothing. N-U-T-H-I-N. Don't need nothing. Our God is so self-sufficient, so powerful. You ever heard that? So, why did, why did God create people? Because he was lonely. You heard that one? No, he weren't. God is self-sufficient. He don't need us. He don't need you. He don't need me. God is fully self-sufficient. God is God. I am who I am. He chose to want us. Now, if you don't get anything else today, take that home and absolutely, while you're watching Pat Mahomes win the Super Bowl today, remember a self-sufficient God who needs nothing wants you. So think of that big, lofty Yahweh. Lord is my what? Shepherd. Hmm. That's bringing it on down just a little bit, right? 
You see, shepherds at this particular time, in the time of Jesus, we have a different thing. Shepherds are, are of high esteem. It's usually the youngest male member of the family, i.e. David, who are out. And you know what? They don't, they don't have, they don't have pins and they don't have you know squeeze chutes and they don't have big trailers and all that sort of stuff they live with the sheep so shepherds smell like sheep and sheep smell really bad right so interesting thing about sheep i love this in the in the scripture Here's another esteeming thing. God's self-sufficient. He's our shepherd. He's willing to get right down in the muck and the mire. Most people have ever raised sheep will tell you it's one of the only animals on earth that is born looking for a place to die. You see, when they talk about sheep, it's not always esteeming. It's kind of showing our place a little bit and how badly we need our self-sufficient God to actually come be our shepherd. So God... Yahweh, Adonai, the Lord, is now come down to be our shepherd. That is an amazing, powerful, overwhelming thought. And it says this, I shall not be in want. You're probably thinking, well, I'm in want. There's a F-250 Platinum has got my name on it somewhere. I'm in want, right? I'm in want of a big house. I'm in want of a you got a lot of wants, right? Well, he's talking about the sufficiency that we need to actually be a part of the herd. To be a part of the community that is following Adonai, Yahweh, the Lord. I don't need anything. The Lord's going to take care of me. And then he says this. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Don't you love the text? He makes me, you know why he makes us lie down? Because we ain't real bright. Lay down. You ever told your kids that when they're going to bed? Ooh, bedtime's a challenge. And all the parents said, amen, right? Like you need to, honey, sweetie, you just need to lay, lay down. Don't get up. If you get up, something bad will happen. I don't know what it is, but just don't get up, right? We figure some way to convince our children they must lay down. It says he makes me lie down. And I I like that because I think there are times, because he's trying to do a picture. Hebrew people operate in pictures. He's trying to say, I'm going to make you lie down because something special is coming. Won't you lie down? Cool your jets. Chill out. Calm down. Something amazing is coming. He makes me... Lie down in green pastures. You know what that means? That's pastures where the good food is. You know? That's Market Street. With a big old fat gift card, right? It's one of those situations where he's saying, I'm going to take care of you. I'm not going to be in want. I'm going to take you to place to place to place. To give you the sufficiency you need to be a part of the herd that is the most important in my life. You see, a shepherd is deeply invested in the sheep. They're the door. They're the gate. They sleep with them. They carry them. Protect them. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me down. I'm not in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And then I love this picture. He leads me beside, what does it say? Quiet waters. Better translation. You ever heard still waters? Hebrew people don't do still water. All right, West Texas people don't do still water. If water ain't moving, you ain't drinking it, right? That's fracking water, right? Don't touch that, right? If water ain't moving, it's not life-giving. So there's a picture. He's saying, the Lord has come down to be my shepherd I'm, I'm not worried about my sustenance anymore. Not only am I not worried about my sustenance, he, he's going to take care of me. He's, he's making me lie. Dude, chill out. Chill out. I'm, I'm going to feed you. Chill out. I got this. And he's going to make me lie down in green pastures. Not only that, he's going to lead me beside still water. So let me give you a picture. So several years ago, my family and I were given a trip to uh, a, a place in Colorado. I can't remember. What was the name of the Colorado town? Steamboat. There it was. That's why I have my wife here. 
She's wonderful. And I also have my mom and my middle daughter here, too. And if they want to tell any stories about me, they're absolutely false. Anyway, um, so we went to Steamboat Springs, amazing, beautiful Colorado town, okay? A few more trees than here. A few, okay? And uh, and amazing uh, mountains. And so we'd been told about this place called Fish Creek Falls. Fish Creek Falls was just stunning. So we packed a lunch, and we were going to hike up to Fish Creek Falls. The kids were little, and, you know, there's, they're on the trail, there's all sorts of signs that say, don't get off the trail, don't get off the trail. That's, don't tell somebody from West Texas to get off the trail, right? You know, we're a lot of squat and watch people, ain't we? So anyway, I'm like, we're going to stay on the trail, we're going to do what we're supposed to do, but at one point it was time to have, it was time to have lunch. And I looked over next to the stream, off the trail and it was stunning streams coming down these still quiet waters i mean there is moss and stuff growing that i don't even know what it was but it was all green and we sat down there we pulled out our lunch and it was one of the most calming amazingly indescribable moments besides still waters, quiet, running waters. That's the picture he's giving. So do you, do you see the progression? He's saying, okay, all sufficient, all powerful. God is God, bigger and big, larger and large. Don't need nothing. Is going to come be my shepherd and hang out with stinky old me. And then every once in a while, he's going to make me lie down. You need to lie down. You should lie down. He's going to put me in this green field. He's going to take care of my needs. And then he's going to bring such a calmness to me that it's overwhelming, like sitting next to the stream in Fish Creek Falls. And then he's going to do something remarkable. Last part of the sentence. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. Now, there's a lot of things that came to your mind whenever we said soul. You know, some of you, in your back of your minds, you, you're raised in the 70s and you hear soul train, right? That's hitting your brain just a little bit. Some of you are going, yeah, I need to get them boots resold. You're thinking about different things. Are you thinking soul in the Greek sense is just your point of emotions. When a Hebrew person hears the word restoring, aruka, refreshing the soul, the nephesh, here's what they hear. They hear they're restoring me. Not just a piece of me, but me. Behind that word, Nephesh is, is, is the concept of, uh, have you ever, you ever been out of breath? You just run in, you're out of breath, and, and, you know, or you had to get up and get the remote to change the channel, and you sat back down, and you're catching your breath. You know what I'm talking about, right? And you're just, and then when that breath comes back, and you're like, oh. Or you've been working in the yard, sweating like a horse on a track. And you sit down and that breeze comes across and that lemonade shows up and you're like, oh. He's saying, the great shepherd is going to calm you down, take care of your needs, and then he's going to restore, he's going to bring a full restoration to who you are. Like a breath of fresh air. Like when he breathed into the, these people called Adam and Eve. And they came to be who they are. So let me ask you that question again. Who are you? Who, who are you? So think about it for just a minute. 
We have different perceptions of who we are. When they hear the word soul, they hear this refreshing, this sense of God breathing into this is who I am, this is my identity. He's calmed me down so he can restore who I really am. We have perceptions of who we really are, don't we? Did you know you have a perception of who you are? Did you know that? Ladies, I want to tell you a secret about men as they age. It doesn't matter how old we are. We look in the mirror and we go, I look like I'm 25. Now, it ain't right. But in our minds, we're still 25, right? See, a woman's a little more of a realist. Like, oh, I don't look quite like, you know, guys are like, yeah, I can just I can conquer the world. Look at me. Look like an 18-year-old all-American. Older I get, the better I was, Right? We have a perception of who we are. Then we have a perception of who we think, who other people think we are, right? You ever, we, we've all had those. We had the, you know, that impre- oh, I'm pretty sure so and so is like this. And then we really get to know them. We're like, oh, they're not like that at all. We have a perception of other people. And other people have a perception of us. So we think we know who we are. And other people think they know who we are. And then... The even d- deeper one is, is we, the, thing, the thing that we think other people think of us. Are you with me? You following that? That was not real deep, was it? Yes, real deep, isn't it? So they think that th- I'm this. I think that they think that this is who I am. We all have these weird perceptions around us. And then the fourth one is this. Who we really are, we ain't nobody around. Amen? Or oh me, either one's fine, it's whatever. We have weird senses of perception of who our soul is, who our nephesh is, who when we breathe that life into us, who we really are. And a lot of us live in this weird, exhausting circle of a misidentity. Anybody ever tried to be somebody you ain't? Right? It's exhausting, isn't it? You ever tried to be somebody you thought, even believers thought you were? But it wasn't attached to the great shepherd who created you and created your nephesh, created your soul. And not only did he create your soul, he did something wonderful with it. And not only did that, as we violated it, because every one of us in this room did, he longs to calm us down and refresh it and renew it and make it back to what it was. Who, who are you? Lily Tomlin said this, I've always wanted to be somebody, but I see now I should have been more specific. (laughs) Who are you really? It's exhausting in the information age, isn't it? It's exhausting to know who you are. Our God wants to restore you But I'll never know me unless I know thee. Let me say it again. I'll never know me unless I know thee. You see, when you introduce yourself to people, you usually identify yourself by something other than God Almighty, don't you? I'm David. I'm a pastor. That's ended more conversations than you can possibly imagine. I'm Gina's husband. I'm uh, Megan, Alyssa, or Reese's dad. Or I'm, I'm Carol's son. Or I'm this. I mean, we identify. Or, this is what I do. This is what I'm about. These are the relationships I'm connected to. But that's really not the real you. This is my profession. This is where I'm from. But that's not the real you because you don't know. I don't know me unless I know thee. And if I don't have that experience with the great shepherd, when he calms me, sets me down, when I'm living in this circle of trying to be who I'm really not, or trying to be who I really think somebody needs me to be, or I 
try to be who quintessentially I'm supposed to be. And I live in that exhaust, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes, and the great shepherd's like, you need to sit down. Lay down. I got your stuff. I'll take care of you. Let me calm you by the quiet waters. And then, and then, I'd like to restore your soul, who you really are. So let me ask you this question again. Who are you? And if all those other things have created a trajectory in you that is exhausting you, I want you to know today, this very moment on Super Bowl Sunday when Pat Mahomes will win and be MVP of the league, we're convinced of it, right? Our God would love to restore you to your created order. And not only that, Restore you to the great dream of the great artist that is Jehovah God. And it will be bigger than who you're related to. It will be bigger than your income. It will be bigger than your profession. It will be bigger than any of that stuff. You see, our God wants to restore your me, your soul. I'll never forget, I was doing this mission trip, and uh, we were in a very difficult part of Atlanta. Massive homeless population, uh, high, high crime, and we're uh, a part of this ministry there. And one night, uh, we were gathering up, we were praying for each other, and all of a sudden, one of the people who were doing, leading the prayer time looked at me, and it's just the Lord got all over them, and they said, I, I got to tell you something. The Lord has just told me that you are like the David of the scripture. You are beloved of God. And you have a heart for worshiping authentically like King David did. Transformative to who I was. Because all of a sudden the other stuff faded. And I knew me because I knew thee. That's the restoration our God would love to do in your soul today. It sounds like good news to you. That's the powerful thing that our God wants to do for you today. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in one. He makes me Lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still or quiet waters. He restores me. Who I am. My soul. Lord, I know that here today in this place there are many who may struggle with who they are with their identity, with their sense of who they really are today. And I pray now, Lord Jesus, in the next few moments, that they would find themselves feeling your restoring Holy Spirit. We thank you that our all-sufficient God, Adonai, Yahweh, has come and is willing to get right in the middle of living with a sheep. Sheep that carry identities that are attached to things that are not the great shepherd. And so, Lord, we apologize for that. And we ask now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would speak to our souls and refresh them. Refresh us and who we really are like that cool breeze, like catching our breath when we're tired. So Lord, I pray you'd relieve us of our striving to be 
and help us to know me because we know thee. In Jesus' holy name, amen.